everybody. <laughs> that was a really fast transition. I'm not sure I was ready for that. But I want to welcome you, and I want to do a couple things right away. I want to say welcome to Palm Sunday. You know, my kids got these a few years ago. I keep them on my office, and uh, whenever I look at them, I, I don't know. To me, it's, it, it's, it's kind of hard to say happy Palm Sunday because when you think about how much the people bless Jesus coming into Jerusalem, but we know what's going to happen a week later. Everybody that thought he was a wonderful king, when they don't get what they want right away, uh, they turn. And, and you know, we're living in a, a time right now where uh, some people, when there's pressure or they're afraid for their own health or their own lives, can, can suddenly treat others horribly when they're not getting something they want. So uh, one thing I want to say right up front, happy Palm Sunday, but also watch ourselves Palm Sunday. And, and I, I want to jump in there. There's a lot of good teaching today that I think is, is really going to be beneficial and encouraging in Acts 26. I hope you, you grab your Bible and, you, and you're ready to look at this because this is a, a, a great passage. And uh, you may say, well, it's Chris talking about the story of, of Jesus today. Well, of course, I'm always talking about the story of Jesus. Everything in Scripture points to it. But in, in Acts 26, we've been going through... Uh, the book of Acts, teaching through the book of Acts. And that's one of the things we do at Journey. We, I, I take a, a book of the Bible and I, I teach through it faithfully. I don't uh, skip over anything. I don't ignore anything. I uh, have to teach everything. And I've had people ask me before, well, when are you going to teach on tithing? When the Bible calls for it. <laughs> when are you going to teach on sin? When the Bible addresses sin. You see, when you are, are teaching the Lord's word in the way we do, uh, you can't watch a video or come in and think I'm talking about you because I'm not picking anything to talk about anyone specifically. I'm teaching through God's word. And, and as we've been going through God's word, it's important to give you a little bit of setup. And then what I'm going to do is, is give you a little bit of, of my salvation story. I think coming into Easter, it's good to hear these salvation stories. You're, you're going to hear a little bit of Paul's today and, and what he was teaching. You're going to hear a little bit of mine. And then at the end of the story, you're going to see at the end of the sermon how people responded to the sermon by Paul. Now, you don't have to wonder how much I like Paul as, as an apostle, as an early church planner, as a leader in the church. You don't have to wonder because I'll tell you, my son's name is Paul. And he's not named after any Paul in my family. I'm actually not aware of any Paul in my family. He is named after the Apostle Paul. And as much as I've been teaching uh, on Paul through the book of Acts, we've been going through all three of his missionary journeys. And now he's as he's in prison and he's getting ready to go to Rome, as much as I've taught about him, my son's head always looks around and he has to figure out which Paul I'm talking about. Well, this Paul uh, in Acts 26, his story uh, coming into Acts 26 actually started in Acts 21:17. In Acts 21, 17, Paul gathers up uh, some Gentile elders from the church he, he, churches he planted outside of Jerusalem. And, and he brings some offering and some elders and he endeavors to come to Jerusalem. And, and he endeavors to, to come and bring them to give gifts to the church there. And I think what was really on Paul's mind was to see that one foundation of Jesus Christ and to see both Gentiles and Jews and all of them gathering together to, to worship the Savior at, at Pentecost. This was what was going on in Jerusalem at that time. And so Paul gets there and he meets with, with the church in Jerusalem and, and he, he tells them of the passion he has for Christ among the Gentiles. And they say, well, that's great. And then they say, we have a passion for the law here in Jerusalem. And he says, oh, and they say, well, our people may not want to hear from you very much because they've heard that you've thrown off all of our Jewish customs. And, and so we need you to go into the temple for a week and to take this Nazarite vow and to take four of our guys with us and show us how much you love the law. And then you'll be able to start kind of bringing the church together and giving these gifts. And uh, Paul says, OK. And, and he goes in taking this vow. Now, I don't think it's a good deal. And it turns out to be a bad deal for Paul at the end of the week. Uh, some some Jews accuse him of taking a Gentile into the temple courts, which was punishable by death. 
Now, this was a made up charge for, for from some Jews who were uh, had seen Paul in Ephesus and didn't like him there. And now they were in Jerusalem and th they were just bringing up a false charge to try to get him killed. And, and a, a big fight breaks out in the temple complex. Well, Roman guards come down, they rescue Paul and they take him up uh, to, to the, bar the Roman barracks. But on his way up, Paul says, can I speak to people? Can I address people? A hush falls over the crowds. And he begins to tell them his story of how Jesus met him on the road to Damascus and gave him a task to do. And then he says that God has been working and saving the Gentiles. And when they hear the word Gentile, that's what they were mad about anyway. That's what these false accusations were, because they didn't believe that any of the unholy dogs, the Gentiles, were allowed anywhere near God's holiness. Well, a riot broke out a second time. They had to take Paul and put him in way. And then uh, after that, Paul was going to go before the Sanhedrin. And when he went before the Sanhedrin, he, he talked about the resurrection. And the, the Pharisees believed in the resurrection. The Sadducees didn't. And so when Paul brought up the resurrection, another fight started. And again, the Romans had to pull him out and take him back to the barracks. And there Paul sat in the barracks. Well, during this time, the Pharisees and Sadducees, the Sanhedrin, formed a plot to try to kill Paul. And so what they were going to do is ask the Romans to bring him again. But on the way down, they were going to have him killed. Matter of fact, some of the Jewish young men in the area had taken a vow that they wouldn't eat until Paul was dead. Well, Paul's nephew somehow heard of this and he went to the barracks and alerted them. And, and the Roman guards said, we need to get Paul out of town overnight to keep him safe. So they sent him to the king's palace in Caesarea, about 80 miles away. And they gave him about, I think it was about 450 guards. <laughs> I don't know how a brother gets uh, the elite guard watching him going on that journey, but, but he did. And, and he was uh, under house arrest there waiting on them to come put him on trial. And then they, they finally came and, and put him on trial. They had a, a young lawyer show up and, and talk, but Paul could only defend himself. And at the end of that defense, uh, the governor at that time, Felix, didn't really know what to do, couldn't find any guilt, but didn't want the Jews mad at him. So he just left Paul in prison for two years. And then uh, after those couple of years, Felix got himself in trouble. He was, he was very rough, and he had sent some guards in not only to, to kill some, some, a Jewish uprising, but to, to plunder everything. So he was recalled to Rome, and the man that we find in this passage, Festus, was put in place. Now, Festus was an older man. He didn't have any kind of religious background. He didn't know the Jews well. And, and he didn't know the Jewish custom very well. He goes in to Jerusalem to, to, from Caesarea. He goes over to kind of say hi and to see the area that he's ruling now. And right away, after two years, and an entirely different leadership, the Sanhedrin asked for Paul's head right away. And they come and, and want to talk. And, and Festus doesn't know what to do. Well... King Herod Agrippa comes into town to spend some time with Festa, with his consort Bernice, who is also his sister. It's a little bit unseemly, but the two of them come in. And if you know the name Herod, you know Herod tried to kill the young children. This was a different Herod in the family line. There was a Herod that killed John the Baptist, a different Herod in the family line. There was a Herod that had uh, Peter and John imprisoned or Peter and James in prison, I'm sorry, and had James killed, a different Herod. But this was the family line, and this was Herod Agrippa II was the last of the Herods. Now Herod comes into town, and Festus wants his counsel. What do I do? What do I do? You understand the Jews. You know what's going on now. Uh, the name Herod to the early Christians had to be a little bit nerve-wracking here that he was going to be the one giving counsel to Festus. And uh, the week I shared that sermon, I talked about how getting good counsel is really important. Uh, this was a bad person to be counseling you on what to do with Paul. But nonetheless, he's there. And Festus is there. And, and they bring, decide to bring in Paul to make his case. And last week, we looked at the first 18 verses of this chapter. And, and that was the beginning of Paul's case. And Paul's case was basically this. Listen, Jesus called me and he gave me this to do. If you have any blame blame the Messiah. 
And, and you'll see that a little bit at the end of his sermon today. But, but the reason I want to split these two up is last week I was looking at the, the basic defense of Paul in this room with, with these two kings, with, with Festus, who was the governor of the region, with Herod Agrippa the second who came from this terrifying background. And, and in this room, in this big theater, all the wealthiest people in town came and lined the walls. People of power were all around. Can you imagine Paul, after being wrongfully imprisoned for two years, waiting? The Lord had told him he was going to go to Rome, and he's waiting all this time. And now he makes his defense. Well, if you want to check out last week's video, you can see the first part of this. But tonight, I really want to give you this second part. And, and this is powerful. And so, so I hope you'll stay. I hope you'll listen to this and I hope you'll let it go into you a little bit. Because when, when this man of God stands up after years of waiting in this powerful crowd where he doesn't look so uh, rich or wealthy, or powerful. He speaks a powerful message of truth to those in the room. And, and you know, one of the things that, that I always believe over the years is it, it's, not, it's not how the preacher looks. It's whether you can deliver. If you can deliver the word of God. And, and to me, I don't always like to dress up. If you've been around me, I, 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 had, I had mentioned wearing a suit this Easter. And uh, now look at what's happened. <laughs> um, uh, but and, and some people look forward to seeing me in a suit. But but one thing I want to say about that, too, um, for all of our regular journey people, if you're watching this, I, what I'm really thinking and praying about doing is is uh, punting Easter out to the second week of June. What do you think about doing Palm Sunday first week of June and Easter on the second week and having some uh, teaching specific, having a sunrise service and, and, uh, and hopefully by then we can have some food, something in June. So I don't know. Let me know, comment, send me a message, but let me get back to this. I want to read to you Acts 26, 19 through 32. This is the end of Paul's sermon and his altar call. It's the end of Paul's sermon and his altar call. And, and I did a, a midweek video this week about, uh, about God redirecting our lives because we're all on a redirect. And if, if you haven't seen that and you're interested in, in life being redirected or interrupted by things and what God can do with that, check out that video. But, but here's the thing. In Acts 26, as he wraps up the sermon, he's going to offer them a redirect. Accept Christ. Accept him. Follow him like I did. And it will redirect you. So as I read this, I would encourage you, listen for the redirect, listen for the end of sermon, sermon, and listen for their response. Now, if I read this and you hear those things, then you don't have to listen to the rest of the message. Uh, but I hope you will, because I'm going to spell this out so we don't miss it. Be because I think this is an exciting passage. It's a passage where uh, you're going to see the responses to a sermon that pastors get more than they don't get. All right. Let's jump in. Acts 26, 19 through 32. It says, Therefore, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. This is Paul speaking, by the way. Instead, I preached to those in Damascus first and to those in Jerusalem and in all the region of Judea and to all the Gentiles that they should repent, turn to God, and do works worthy of repentance. For this reason, the Jews seized me in the temple complex and were trying to kill me. To this very day, I have obtained help that comes from God. And I stand to testify both small and great, both to the small and great, saying nothing else than what the prophets and Moses said would take place, that the Messiah must suffer and that as the, that as the first to rise from the dead, he will proclaim light to our people and to the Gentiles. As he was making his defense this way, Festus exclaimed in a loud voice, you're out of your mind, Paul. Too much studying is driving you mad. But Paul replied, I'm not out of my mind, most excellent Festus. On the contrary, I'm speaking words of truth and good judgment. For the king knows about these matters. It is to him I am actually speaking boldly, for I am convinced that none of these things escapes his notice, since this was not done in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know you believe. Then Agrippa said to Paul, are you going to persuade me to become a Christian so easily? I wish before God, replied Paul, that whether easy or with difficulty, not only you, 
But all who listen to me today might become as I am, except for these chains. So the king, the governor Bernice, and those sitting with them got up. And when they had left, they talked to each other and said, This man is doing nothing that deserves death or chains. Then Agrippa said to Festus, This man could have been released if he had not appealed to Caesar. Now, this is a, a, a lot to take in. But you see their reactions to Paul's message. And I want to back up real quick. I want to give you three things that Paul did on ending his message. And I don't know if any of you have worked in sales. I know one of my first jobs when I was younger, first out of college, uh, I could only be a youth pastor and then work in sales. I was so young and I was so green. And, uh, you know, I, I'm still a little rough around the edges. But, but one of the things I learned in sales, you have to close the sale. I, I could get on the phone and talk to somebody about all the products we had. I worked for David C. Cook. Later on, I worked for Scripture Press with all kinds of, of uh, Sunday school curriculum and, and teaching and teacher training materials. But at the end of the phone call, you had to ask, would you like to buy this? Would you, you have to ask for the sale or you don't close the sale. And I like to talk to people, but you get a little nervous. And I remember I had one boss uh, and, and when I started there and, and he gave me a few accounts and he said, call these pastors. Well, I didn't know, but they were guys that were already ready to buy. So when I called them, as soon as I called them and, and, and went over a couple things, they started giving me a list of stuff. And, and I remember I was so happy. I went back to him and he said, now, did you only sell them the stuff they asked for? And I said, yes. And he said, that's not your job. You need to suggest some other curriculum that might be helpful for them in, in their program. He goes, I could have taken this order, but I gave it to you because I wanted you to expand the order. You know, one of the things as a pastor over the years, I don't want you to get the least amount of Jesus in your life. I want you to have access to all of him, all of the resurrection, all of who he is, all of the Holy Spirit's power in your life. And I want you to hear this as Paul closes this out. He brings it powerfully. I love verse 19. Look at right at the beginning. He says, therefore, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. He's talking about it's, he was on the road to Damascus to hunt down Christians, to kill them. And God stopped him mid work and said, you will, Jesus said, you will serve me and you will be a minister to the Gentiles where I send you. And Paul says, I wasn't disobedient. Now, he could have said this in the positive. I was obedient. Uh, it's interesting in the Greek here, the way this is uh, formulated, it's actually stronger than the positive. Yeah, I was doing the disobedience. I was being, and I was, as soon as I met Jesus, I wasn't disobedient anymore. This is the tie to what he had been doing, to what he was now going to do. He, he got caught in his disobedience and he admitted it and said, I was immediately not disobedient anymore. This shows the immediate of his obedience. You know, if Christ calls you today about something, you could immediately be obedient. But sometimes we put it off. Well, maybe tomorrow I'll do that or next week I'll do that. Or I'll write to that check to the church later. Whatever it is, Lord, I'll address that sin in my life later or just give me another day. I'm going to warm up to it. Stop doing that. Look at what Paul says. He's getting ready to close this out, and he's challenging anybody who's moved by God's Holy Spirit. Listen, if anything I've said to you in this message applies to you, look at the immediate obedience in my life. I love this. He, he matter of fact, he, he talks about his immediate change from disobedient to obedient. As, and he says, instead, I preach to those in Damascus. <laughs> I mean... Paul preached to those in Damascus. He went there to, to be able to get the okay to kill Christians. And suddenly he starts preaching in that very place about Jesus. Immediate obedience. This is what happens when God redirects our lives. When he comes to us, when he makes a change in us, when Jesus showed up on that road and said, Paul, you're not going to live like this anymore. Paul immediately obeyed. And, you know, sometimes we think, well, Lord, I'll do it later. There's not always a later. 
I'll never forget one time saying to my grandpa that you know, when my wife and I are back somewhere and he stopped me and he said, son, you need to learn not to say that because you never know when you'll get a chance to go back. Sometimes you don't. Make the most of every opportunity. Immediate, immediate obedience. Well, the second thing that Paul closes out is is he gives the message. He says what message he was giving. And you can see it in verse 20. He says, I preached to those in Damascus. Okay, what did he preach right away? To those there, those in Jerusalem and all the regions. He preached one thing over and over and over to the Gentiles. He said, repent and turn to God and do works worthy of repentance. This is the original message. This is what Jesus told him. Repent. Turn to me. Repent literally in the Greek means to turn from the way you're going the other way. A 180. You were going the wrong way. Turn to Christ. He's right there. Your way is the opposite of his way. Paul's way was the opposite. He The first thing he did was he repented. And that repent is a turn. So then you say, why does it say turn to God's way of thinking? It says the word turn twice. It does. Repent. And as you're turning, don't just turn your body to face Christ. Turn your mind. Turn to God's way of doing things. Turn to God's way of thinking. You know, you can turn around to somebody and you can repent. And then you can continue doing what you wanted to do. And that is not what we're called to do. We're not only called to, to turn to Jesus and say, I'm sorry, I've been living for myself. I've been serving myself. I've been caring for myself. I have not been obedient to you at all. We're not only called to turn to him and confess our sins, but then we're to put on his mind. So we start living the way that he wants us to live. And that's the second thing here. Not only repent, but turn to God's way of thinking. That's what turn to God means. Turn to him. Whenever you're not sure about what to do, turn to him. Get in the word. Think about what would God have you do, not what would you do, not what your family has done, not what your reactions are in the flesh. What would the good Lord have you do? You turn to him and you ask him and you take counsel in him and then he directs your paths. Why does he direct your paths? Because you directing your paths was the reason you came to Christ anyway. You have no business doing it. Repent. Turn to God. And the third thing, do works worthy of repentance. Now, a lot of people say, oh, works. You shouldn't judge me on works. Listen, we're to be judged on our fruit. If you're going to repent and you're going to put on the mind of the Lord and do things his way, shouldn't the works of your life reflect that? Somebody should be able to look at you and say, yeah, that person lives like a believer. That person lives as God instructs. I see the Lord living in you. You know, when when people, and sometimes people have said very nice things to me, I'm always humbled by that because I know that I <laughs> repent all the time. I'm not a perfect person. I know this original message and I live it over and over and over. And by the way, I told you at the beginning, I was going to tell you a little bit about my salvation story this is the perfect place to do it when i was 13 years old my dad took me to a christian rock concert in my high school the guy's name was sammy hall i have no idea where he is now but he had this electric guitar and this amp and he came out on stage and i liked the the rock music as a kid and my dad liked that kind of music too and i remember my dad worked a lot but he took off work that night for whatever reason to bring me to this rock concert at the school. And I, I'm not sure he knew what it was about, but, but, and I don't remember one single song, but I can still to this day, remember that guy giving the altar call. And, and he, he pretty much said this. He said, y you're a sinner and you need the Lord. No one else can forgive you. Like Jesus can forgive you because no one else can give you eternal forgiveness. And I never thought about it that before. You know, you can get a little bit of forgiveness or you can move forward. You can be reminded of things by people to keep you on the whatever path. But, but he was talking about total forgiveness. And I remember as a young man thinking, 13 years old, thinking that's what I want. I want eternal forgiveness. I want my sin removed so far away that no one will ever remember it. And I don't have a great story because how much trouble can you get into at 13? 
I mean, I would lie to my parents. I would try to change the grades on my report card because I was good in school. I, I would tell them things sometimes to stay out of trouble that weren't weren't true. I would run off in the woods with my friends and not come home when I was supposed to. I did a lot of those types of things. But, I mean, on the scale of things in our world today, sometimes that seems silly. But I remember even as a kid at 13, I was burdened by that. And I heard this message of repentance. And I, I heard this message about if you turn to God, he's going to give you his Holy Spirit. And he's going to start to instruct you his ways. And I remember thinking I had some struggles in school. And, and I remember thinking, Lord, I, I, I want that help. I need some guidance. And I remember that encouragement of, okay, if you're going to be a believer, tell somebody today. And I, after that concert i remember I, I at the end of it i went down i went up to the stage and they had some people trained to kind of work the altar and they were i don't know high school kids probably just a couple years older than me 15 or 16 maybe and i remember the 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 kid that had the sheet for me he was showing it to me and i started looking at it and reading it and i started explaining to him what was on the sheet that i needed to go back and tell my pastor that i might want to consider baptism that week and and, and I remember that kid looking at me and saying something to the effect of, maybe one day you'll be a preacher. <laughs> I remember God's Holy Spirit immediately starting to help me to understand what I needed to do. That's my story. And over the years, I, there were moments I tried to get away from the Lord. And when I went to college, I wanted to be in communication arts. <laughs> and that program wasn't wasn't great and i wasn't great to them there was uh me trying to play randy stonehill i don't know if you knew who that is but there were certain things like u2's joshua tree i was trying to play on the radio a lot and on the 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 college radio station and i got into it with the head of the the communications art department uh, partially my immaturity but you know what god used all of my foolishness trying to do what i wanted to do and the day I went in to talk to Dr. Bob and Dr. Besantz and some of my great mentors about coming into the Bible department, those guys all came out of their offices, sat with me in the middle of the Bible department. They prayed with me, encouraged me. And they told me, yeah, we wanted you in this department when you came here, Chris. And we knew God was going to get a hold of you. And I remember weeping. And over the course of my life, I've had people encourage me to stay on the path this week a buddy of mine uh, had um, Michael Sweet the head of um, Striper uh, do one of those cameo shout outs to me and I, I don't know it just meant a lot to me personally it meant a lot to me because of my journey and who I am and it and that original message when I was 13 having some rock guy come into my school and share the gospel. And then this week, my friend Bill didn't know, but that was such an encouragement to have a rock guy encourage me. Because the original message in my life still holds true. That I'm going to try to serve Christ. That he called me to repent. He called me to put on the mind of Christ. And he called me to live like it. And I try. If you've known me over the past 30, 40 years, as a 50-year-old man, I started when I was 13 trying to live for Christ. And I'm still trying to do it. Why am I a pastor? Well, it's not because it was easy for me. It's because this has been God's call on my life for me. It was my immediate obedience that day when I was 13 that some kid that I don't even know who it was spoke into me. Maybe one day it would be a pastor. And then people along the way encouraging me, no, this is your call. And I know that's my call. But man, I wanted to fight that call because I don't feel good enough to be a pastor, to be honest with you. I think God should have the best. I'm glad he chose me. The original message. And Paul preached the original message, repent, turn to God, and live like it. He preached that everywhere. Repent. Turn to God for all your answers. And live like you're his. That is a great close to his sermon. And, and then uh, they may have thought, well, Paul, we saved you. The Roman guard saved you. Or we brought you here. Then Paul tells them about his total dependence. In verse 21, he says, For this reason the Jews seized me in the temple complex and were trying to kill me. To this very day I have obtained help that comes from God. And I stand here to testify to both small and great, saying nothing else than what the prophets and Moses would take place, that the Messiah must suffer, and that as the first to rise from the dead, he would proclaim light to our people and to the Gentiles. I love this. 
Paul says, listen, you may have thought you were helping me. You may have thought I might get help or finances from the outside. But here's the thing. All of my help comes from only one source. The resurrected Savior that I serve. Jesus, who got up from the grave. He's the one protecting me. My God is the one protecting me. And all of the prophets and, and Moses, the, the keeper of the law, the law and the prophets all pointed to him. And he is the one protecting me. What a way to close. Repent. Turn to God. Live like it. And if anybody has problem with that, let the Lord have your back. Because he's had mine for years. And guys, I got to tell you, the Lord has had my back for years. He has protected me from things that I look back and could have been taken out. I have pastor friends that have been taken out. for the, and, and the Lord has always, for whatever reason, protected me. And Paul says these things that are very dear to his heart. The, the Lord's the one that's brought me here. And I have a message for you. And all of the ancient law and prophets that the, the Jews base everything on, they, they pointed to Jesus. This is the true way. It's kind of the offers there. Now will you believe? And Festus goes first in verse 24. After Paul talks about a immediate obedience, a, after he talks about the original message, after he talks about total dependence, verse 24 happens. Festus says, as Paul was making his defense, he says in a loud voice, you're out of your mind, Paul. Too much study is driving you mad. You're crazy. Listen, Paul, you're a sharp guy and, and you sound great, but this is crazy. Isn't that the way a lot of people re respond to pastors sometimes? You, you guys are crazy. And they lump us all together. I know I've been lumped together with all kinds of other pastors. Oh, you guys are just all crazy. I know you're out there living for Jesus. You're into all that Bible stuff. And I, I've had people tell me, well, I'm glad that works for you. I'm glad all that Jesus stuff works for you. Makes you feel better. Helps you get through. You're crazy, though. All that studying you're doing in God's Word during the week. <laughs> I love Paul's response. Paul says, I'm not out of my mind. On the contrary, I'm speaking words of truth and sound judgment. Some translations say good judgment. It's sound judgment. The Lord's promise to, to the man and woman of God is that he gives us a sound mind as we look on his word. Now, the world may call us crazy and ridicule us and make fun of us, but listen, we're the sane ones. In a world gone mad, those who trust the creator of that world are not crazy. Believers are very sane. And I've had people try to, to tell me all of the, the study of my life has been about a man that didn't even exist. Well, Jesus was either crazy or fiction or insane. But there's a lot of proof he lived. And I have chosen in my life to trust the 12 to trust the teaching of the apostles i've chosen to trust paul that he saw jesus on the road to damascus and i don't think paul would make this up because look how far he's gone would you go this far on a lie i wouldn't risk my life on a lie paul comes in he tells them listen repent turn to god live like it and you can trust christ to have your back and festus says that's just crazy but you know what Pastors get that response to sermons a lot. And if you're a believer and you've tried to share your faith and people act like you're crazy, get used to it. Because they will. They'll do it. You're crazy. That works for you. Whatever thing you want to do, you go ahead and go to church. You invest your life in that crazy stuff. I'm going to go over here and get a job. I had somebody tell me once, listen, pastor, I'll work and you pray. And we'll see who gets there first. Gets where? My prayer is work. It's blessed work. And I love it. Well, anyway, that's the first response is, you're crazy. Pastors get that a lot. That is a response to a sermon. Paul tried to close here, and he closed strong. He said, you could have a new life, and it could look like this. Festus says, not from me. Crazy. Let's look at King Agrippa. And Paul says, 
No, I, this was really for Agrippa. He says, I, I'm speaking boldly, for I am convinced that none of these es things escape Agrippa's notice, since this was not done in a corner. And then he says, King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know you believe. And then Agrippa said to Paul, are you going to persuade me to become a Christian so easily? One of my favorite things in this study was trying to figure out if Agrippa was being kind of mean and sarcastic. Oh, you think it's so easy. Or if he was tempted and curious. I don't know if he was saying it's easy for you as a slight. Or if maybe he was tempted and he was saying, Paul, it's easy for you. You're a believer. You've been doing this. You've got these churches. You've invested a lot of your life in it. But for me, it's not so easy. And, and just think about Paul's background. When he was on that road to Damascus, he was he had been rising up uh, through the Sanhedrin faster than anybody else. He was a man of great clout and great power from a great family. And now his father was even a Pharisee. And, and, and now he was going to have nothing. His whole family was going to be cut off from him when he made this turn towards Christ, all of his education in the best schools and under the best teachers, all of the, the people that once respected him would now turn their back on Paul. But Paul lost it all and trusted in Jesus to have his back. So for somebody to say, oh, it's easy for you, you know, you think it's so easy. I don't think Paul thought it was easy. Sure, Paul had been immediately obedient. Sure, he had preached the original message that he heard over and over. Sure, he had totally depended on God for his for help. But it wasn't easy. And for Herod Agrippa II to say, easy for you. I want to say this is another response the pastors get on Sunday morning sometimes. We we'll deliver a sermon. Oh, it's easy for you as a pastor. To live for Christ. It's easy for you as an elder or a deacon in the church. Or it's easy for you as a Sunday school teacher. It's easy for you because you've invested in your whole life. But I don't think I can change and do that. I don't think people would take it seriously. I don't think I could come across for Christ. I don't think the redirect to turn to Jesus for forgiveness, to, to put on his mind. I don't think I'm too old to put on his mind and live for him. I've been living this other way too long. It's easy for you. It's hard for me guys. I don't know when I was 13, I don't know that there was any huge life change right away. I know the next week I got baptized in our church. My dad took me the next day and dropped me off at our pastor's office. And I talked to him about what happened. And he said, well, Chris, this is what you do. And I, I remember going to even adult Bible studies when I was a kid. And I, I felt like I, I was dumb about a lot of stuff as a kid, but I, I feel like I've always had good insight into spiritual things. And I, I've come to learn it's because I have a cheat sheet. It's got the Holy Spirit inside of me helping me. I know how weak I am, but I know how strong my God is. It wasn't easy for me over the years. When I was in high school, I remember not going to a lot of parties and staying in. I'm not saying that to be proud of myself. I, I was kind of an awkward kid anyway. But it wasn't easy to feel like I was on the outside. But I'm glad God kept me from things. He didn't keep me from everything. But he helped me. I love how Paul finishes this out. In, in verse 19, or in verse 29, he says, I wish before God replied, Paul, that whether easy or with difficulty... Not only to you, but to all who listen to me today might become as I am. A guy standing there in chains who'd been in prison unfairly, didn't look wealthy, didn't look powerful. The powerful people of town were all around him. A king and a governor all sitting there, putting him under thumb. And he says, oh, man, I wish you could be like me. Oh, man. I wish you could meet Christ today. I wish you could be obedient to him. I wish you could hear his message. I wish you could totally depend on him because then you would never be concerned about losing your wealth or your power or your might or your business. You wouldn't be concerned about any of that anymore because you would find the true source of life that I found and I'm happy in every way except I don't want any of you to be chained up like I am. <laughs> I've never been chained to give a sermon. But Paul was. His defense was a, a message. His defense was, listen, Christ got in me and redirected my life and changed everything I do. And he can do that for you. And he made the offer. 
He, he made the offer and said, everything in history is up to this point. Will you guys take the deal? One guy said, you're crazy. The other guy said, oh, it's easy for you to do. Paul was neither crazy nor was it easy. And I want to challenge you. As we're to the end of the, the message here, as we're getting to the end, I want to challenge you. Where are you at? Uh, let me read the, the last thing that happens after Paul gives him this final challenge. I wish you were free like me. Then in verse 30, he says, so the king, it says, so the king and the governor and Bernice and those sitting with them got up. And when they had left, they talked to each other and said, this man is doing nothing that deserves chains. Their response to Paul, their response to Paul, they walked out and shrugged it off. They were presented the gospel. You can repent. You can turn to God. You can live like it. You can have God having your back and being your protection if you serve him. But they said, you're crazy. It's so easy for you. You're a religious man. You're a pastor. Of course it's easy for you. It'd be hard for me. Let me ask you, as you're watching this message today, have you ever heard God tugging on you to want to get a hold of you, to want you to repent of your sins and put on his way of thinking and put yours off? Have you ever wanted to start living like a believer instead of the way you're living? You hear a message and you get real convicted and you've had those moments in your life, but then you walk out and you shrug it off. I would say the one thing about me over the years is I don't walk out and shrug things off. God's pull in my life has been consistent and powerful and he wears me down. Since I was 13, I haven't been able to shrug him off. I've seen him work. I've seen him give me exactly what I want. I had a talk with a, a friend of mine earlier this week, and I was able to tell him over the past few weeks, I've been really down because I'm not an isolation person. I'm a people person. I'm a get out in the workplace person. I'm a go to the coffee shop person. I'm an all over town person. And all of that is shut off and it's wigging me out. And, and the other week, I'll, I'll just tell you this. I, I'm planning to say this, but I, there was no there was no deposit to make it the bank. And normally the elders sign off on that and then I take it on, on Monday. There's a good check on that. So I'm just, don't worry. Pastor's not just handling money. There's no accountability to it. But I had no deposit to make because we're not gathering. And I, and I know I'm a routine person. It bothered me. And, and I took somebody some some gifts. I took I wanted to, to wanted to reach out. And when we took him there, the, the person gave me some money. I said, Pastor, I wanted there to be an offering. I want you to know I want our church to continue no matter. And you know what? I was able to tell my friend, listen, I, I was worried about the offering. And, and I wasn't trying to get the offering. I was trying to give anyway because that's what you do as a believer. When God speaks to your heart, you don't, you don't shrug him off. You keep doing the mission. But I get down and I, I get concerned because I love the church. And, and I love bringing in those ties and putting them in that account and knowing that we can care for more people. Somebody, God gave them that. I, I got a call last week, and, and when we're not meeting, when I'm not preaching on Sunday to to our, our people gathered together, and I, I like to see those eyes. I like to be with our people. I like to hug on our people. It, it hurts me. And last Sunday morning, I had somebody call me, and he said, how's my favorite pastor? And, and you know what? <laughs> not that many people's favorite pastor, but man, that made my day. And I was able to tell my, my friend this week, every time I'm down, everything I'm down about, God has been meeting that need with, with a brief phone call with some, some money handed to me and the amount wasn't important. That might as well have been a million dollars put in my hand this week. It wasn't. It was a very small amount. But for me, the, the amount doesn't matter. What mattered was somebody was giving to the Lord. And I'm here to tell you, it, if you stop walking away from the Lord. If, if you don't shrug him off, if you listen to him and you're faithful to him and you keep believing and trusting and moving forward in Christ, he's going to give you what you need. He's going to give you that little phone call where somebody calls you their favorite. He's going to put a couple bucks in your hand just to reassure you that he's taking care of you. And he's going to use other people in the church to do those affirming things because that's what our God loves to do. Our God put Paul here and they thought Paul was a prisoner. But Paul was their preacher. 
sent to deliver them from chains of this world to freedom that they weren't able to accept. They thought he was crazy. They thought it was easier for him. But they needed a savior. And they walked out and they shrugged it off. What about you? Do, do you say to preachers, oh, that's crazy, that Bible stuff, that's good. Do, do you say, pastor, it's easy for all those religious people. I don't want to get too religious. I don't want Maybe you should. Maybe you should risk it so Jesus has your back. Maybe you should repent of your sins. Maybe you should put on the mind of Christ and be more serious about his ways. Maybe you should try living out what you say you believe. Don't walk out and shrug it off. What will you do? As we move into Easter, Easter gives us that power, doesn't it? The resurrection gives us that power. One of the folks from our church earlier today, I noticed she posted something about Easter is really every Sunday. And you're right. You know, that's why the early church started meeting on Sunday instead of the Jewish Sabbath. They met every Sunday because that's the day Jesus rose and they wanted to celebrate it. And then they would break from their, their meeting and, and, and prayer and worship time and they would go out and knock on doors and start telling people that Jesus got up from the grave. The resurrection, Easter was every single week. And guys, if, if our church moves it out so we can be together for Easter, you'll get to see me in a tie. It'll be a beautiful thing. But I want to gather together. I'm not content with the Easter on the calendar. I want Easter to be every Sunday and I want Easter this year to be when we can gather and really experience it together. When I can see your faces and see you loving each other, crying tears with each other and being together in the flesh as a family. And I, I hate everything that's going on with this virus. I know it's sent from the very pit of hell to torment us, but I know who can have victory over it. And that's not me talking like a crazy person. That's me talking like a very sane person who believes that Christ is my salvation. And oh no, it's not just easy for me. This whole situation is hard for me. But over the years, I'm learning to trust in God. And it's becoming easier for me to see how he is protecting me. So since I've been 13 all the way now to 50, I want to tell you I believe. And I'm not crazy. His gift to me is a sound mind. And it's not easy. Because I have to fight to hang on. And you have to fight to hang on. And we've got to see this through. Because at this point, who else protects us but our Savior? In the world we live in right now, it's good for people to realize that your health has always been at risk. That your life has always been hanging by a thread. That your job has always been something that could perish. But the good Lord, if you trust in Him, if you don't walk out, if you don't shrug Him off, if you stay with Him, He will always have your back and protect you. Now, I don't know how, and I don't know why, but I know he will because he is so good and his love is so real. And what he overcame at death, it's real for us. Well, I'm going to end as I always end. I'm going to say a prayer in a second. But first, I want to tell you, keep it together until we're together. And I mean physically. I, and I know the buildings. I've heard that in the buildings. The buildings aren't important. But I'll tell you what. God's people coming together. The body of Christ in the same place, wherever that place is, it's special. Keep it together until we're together. Use this time to grow in your faith. Use this time not to shrug off the Lord, but to start taking him seriously. And you'll see all the great things the Lord can do. Since I've been 13, since I was 13 years old, I've seen the Lord come through over and over and over. And in one way, it has gotten easier for me because every time I get close to the edge, I see his hand pushing me and I recognize his hand and I watch for his hand and I hope for his hand. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, anybody who wants to make a decision right now for you, I pray that they would make a decision for Christ and that it wouldn't be crazy and that they wouldn't shrug this sermon off and go back to old ways but people will be delivered and made new just like when I was 13 I was made new that night I went forward immediately that next week when I was baptized people saw me pass through the water from death to life in you they saw what had already happened in my heart out for the world to see and Father I've been trying to live that out ever since and you've been delivering me over and over and over from all the foes and you will deliver us from this 
So, Father, I pray that we wouldn't shrug it off, that we wouldn't walk it off, that we wouldn't politely just laugh it off and say, well, the next guy is going to handle Paul now. The next person over may have heard this sermon. We'll let somebody else decide what this is about. No, Father, I pray that everybody who hears this listens for them. And, Father, I pray that you would help me to never get past the original message that you want to preach. I I pray that you would help us to, to stay where we are and to be who we are in you, a repentant people of people with your mind, and of people who live like we truly believe all the things in your word. Father, help us. Help us to turn to you, to take you seriously. And Father, I believe that you will deliver us, not only from everything that's going on right now, but eternally and forever. You will rise us from the dead, even as you were the first fruit. Father, I thank you. I pray we're together soon. And I pray for those watching. Help us, Father, to be encouraged by your word. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. All right, my friends, I gave you the best I could tonight. I don't always love these videos. I'd rather see you, uh, pray with you, encourage you in person. But until the time I can, uh, this is Journey Church Underground. I hope to see you soon.